Good morning, everybody. I think Pastor will be proud with that one. Uh, he was out of town today, so he asked me for me to step in. So if you would, please stand with us, and we're going to sing our first song, I'll Fly Away. Everybody sit down or I'm going to start singing. All right. Good to see everybody here today. 
Tyson's out uh, at a wedding, abandoned his two sons here. <laughs> Cast them to the side. I'm sure they're starving to death. Um, make sure you remember the uh, Thanksgiving baskets. We really want to have a big show um, and uh, collect a lot of food to give to a lot of people uh, this year. Really made a, an impression on the, the schools and, and the city of, uh, of Winton. And uh, uh, it was just a super effort, and a lot of people were really happy about it. So um, just bring what you can and put it there in the, in the uh, foyer and uh, under that table, and hopefully we'll have to find another place to store more of it. Uh, Dr. Bob's Sunday School uh, morning class will resume uh, September the 11th. Uh, it's beginning their study in the Gospel of John's, uh, Gospel of John. Um, children's Sunday School will also resume at that time. Um, we have a, uh, an event of uh, biblical proportions happening tomorrow, the birthday of Dr. Bob. So it would be only appropriate <laughs> if we sing happy birthday. A one and a two and a happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Dr. Bob. Happy birthday to you. He'll be 38. The handbell choir, that's dog years, by the way. Uh, the handbell choir practice will begin this Wednesday, September the 7th. From, quiet, please. From 5.15 to 6.30. Um, there's always room for more people, so if you're interested in being a ding -ling, call or text uh, the lovely and talented Sandra Mobley, and the phone number's there on the, uh, on the brochure. Life groups, the sign-ups are in the lobby. Uh, it's going to be at my house and at the Wolf's here in Atwater. My house in Merced, the Wolf's in uh, Atwater. But it's a, just a great time to get to know each other um, in a more personal way. And, uh, but again, sign up in the lobby there so we know how many people are coming. And if you're using emails, uh, be sure to uh, email the church at office at faithcommunitybible.org. Um, if you want to uh, send us something. Um, and the connection cards. Uh, be sure to fill out your connection card. It's in the seat in front of you if you've got something that you want the church to know, a prayer request, um, just anything that we need to know about what's going on in your life. Um, fill that out, put it in the uh, box there where the offerings go. And that's about it. Anybody got anything burning a hole in their heart that they need to shout out? All right, let's pray. Father, thanks again for today. Uh, day to day, week to week, year to year, you bless us with, with the food that we eat, the air that we breathe, the people that we are in contact with, with this church. Um, you give and give far beyond what we deserve. Um, I I look forward to the day when uh, we're all together with you and um, just that uh, things are the way that they should be. And uh, I, I appreciate the hope that I have in that. And uh, as I say, I, I look forward to that. We, but in, in the meantime, uh, give us the people that we need to talk to. Give us the things that we need to do while we're here. Uh, teach us to count the days. And... Um, to, uh, to cherish the time and to make good use of it for your glory. Uh, bless this church. Uh, protect uh, Tyson and Kim as they're away. Um, just be with our government. Be with the leaders. Just uh, uh, You've said in the, in the Bible that if we pray and humble ourselves that you'll heal our land, and that's what we're asking for. Um, everything from uh, just the philosophies that are running rampant, that are counter- to what it is that you would have um, uh, mundane things like the water in California. We, we pray for water. We pray, pray for rain. Um, uh, just, uh, just give us the things that we need to do what it is that we're supposed to do. 
And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. If you would, go ahead and stand with us again as we sing our next song.
ahead and pray as Dr. Bob makes his way. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for all your blessings. Thank you for being able to come here and worship you, Lord. We pray that you'd give Dr. Bob so, the words to say. Pray that you'd just speak through him. And we pray that you give us a good and a safe rest of the day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, we, we are going to go ahead and dismiss the children to Children's Church. Follow my, my wife is teaching this month, so follow her. This summer in my uh, Bible study group, we looked at the subject of biblical evangelism. And the last lesson that we looked at was focused on Jonah chapter 4 on having the heart of God. How God's heart toward people and toward the lost is much different. That's a lesson Jonah had to learn. And, uh, and that's a lesson we need to learn. Uh, you see, people come to Christ not because of our great techniques uh, not because of we're a real wise person people come to Christ because believers have the heart of God the heart of God he cares about people he cares about all people not just the selected people and that is the key to effective evangelism. So I want to share my heart on this with you today. But I want to start out by reminding you of another very important truth. Uh, by the way, please take out your outlines to follow along and also make some notes. This is a very important subject. And uh, you'll remember a lot more if you'll take notes and use this outline. Uh, but I want to begin by reminding you of another truth. So turn your Bibles, and this is not recorded on your outline, so you may want to write it down. Turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. And I want to read verses 6 through 8. This is the last words that Jesus said to the disciples before he went to be with the Father. You'll notice in verse 9, right after he said these things, he was lifted up in the clouds. He went to be with God the Father. So these, this is a very important statement. Beginning in verse 6, it says, So when they had come together, they were asking him. So the disciples are asking Jesus, Lord, is it at this time you are restoring the kingdom to Israel? They're looking at prophecy here, what he had said. Are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And this is what he says to them. He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or the epics, which the Father has fixed by his own authority. In other words, don't worry about this now. He's not saying prophecy is not important. He's saying this should not be your focus right now. But, verse 8, contrast. He says, don't worry about these which the Father's fixed, the Father has fixed the date, the time, and everything when this will happen. But, he says, this is what I want you to do. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and that happened on the day of Pentecost, and you shall be my witnesses, both in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and even the remotest part of the earth. So Jesus is saying, listen, 
Don't focus on prophecy. Don't focus on the, the by and by that's to come. The Father has all that fixed. But he says, when the Holy Spirit comes, what I want you to do is be my witness. Be a witness. Tell others about me. Tell others about the gospel and what I've done. And he, he gives a, an outline of how he wants us to do it. He says, start in Jerusalem. That's local missions. Our local missions is Merced Atwater. Start in Jerusalem. Then in all Judea and Samaria. That's home missions. Our home mission is the state of California. And then the remotest part of the earth. That's foreign missions. So what he's emphasizing here, the priority in the church, the priority in your life should be to be a witness of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Jesus, uh, this is recorded in Mark 16, 50, uh, when, he, when he commissioned the church, he said, go into all the world and preach or proclaim the gospel. Go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to all people, all different types of people. So once again, he's saying, this should be your priority. This is what I want you to focus on. This is the most important thing. Now, we, when we read passages like this and understand clearly what was being emphasized, we need to ask this question. If he wants us to make the gospel priority, why are there so many churches today? Why are there so many Christians neglecting this priority? And the answer is because they don't have the heart of God for lost people. That's why. And so nothing could be more important than having the heart of God for people. God cares about people. He doesn't care about things. He cares about people and their spiritual destiny. So uh, turn over to Jonah. It may have been a while since you've been in Jonah. Turn to Jonah chapter 4, and I want to walk you through that today and share my heart with you on this. Let me begin by uh, reading to you a true life story. It's about a man named Gus Jensen. The author says Gus Jensen was 84 years old, and he, uh, he was a widower. And every Sunday, he'd sit in the back of the church. Uh, and many people, because that's where he sat every Sunday, viewed Gus as somebody who no longer had much to offer. He just came to church every Sunday. But when Gus's pastor got to know him, he learned otherwise. Gus spent two and a half hours every day in Bible study and prayer. And he followed that with a three-mile walk where he continued to converse with God. Every day. Lately, Gus was concerned about a teenage, uh, teenager named Anthony. Anthony had gotten into trouble and needed uh, Jesus Christ in his life. Gus committed himself, listen to this, Gus committed himself to fasting two meals a day and praying during that time for the salvation of Anthony. And so also any opportunity the Lord gave him to talk to Anthony about Christ, he, did, he followed the Spirit's leading. So Gus spent two and a half hours a day in Bible study and prayer. He prayed when he took his walk every day. He was concerned about this young man, Anthony. 
And so he committed himself to fasting two meals a day uh, and praying during that time and talking to Anthony any time he had an opportunity. And when the pastor asked uh, Gus how long he'd been fasting and praying for Anthony, uh, Gus replied, 40 days. And the pastor asked him, how much longer will you continue to do this? And Gus said, as long as it takes. On day 51, Anthony committed his life to Jesus Christ. Now, the reason Gus was so successful in his evangelistic efforts was not because of his techniques, was not because of his method. It was because he had God's heart for people. And that's what we need. We need God's heart for people. Or lost people. People matter to God. All types of people. We have a tendency to select certain people matter to God. No, all people matter to God. People matter to him. Uh, notice on your outline, Isaiah 118. Remember this? The Lord God says, Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be what? White as snow. And though they are red like as crimson, they shall be like wool. God wants people to be saved. God wants to forgive men of their sins. It was also the heart of Christ. Matthew 23, verse 37, Jesus is standing on a hill overlooking Jerusalem, and he says, O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you kill the prophets and stone those sent to you. How often, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers his chicks under his wing, but you would not be willing. You see, it breaks the heart of Jesus when people reject the gift of salvation. It breaks his heart. He went to great lengths to provide salvation. It breaks his heart when they reject it. See, God has a continual concern in his heart for the salvation of all men. Continue. The greatest need of Christians today is to capture the heart of God for lost people. Now, notice on your outlines, there are three ways God's heart toward people is different from ours. Uh, and this is the lesson Jonah had to learn. Notice on your outline, um, first of all, God's heart is impartial. God doesn't just love certain kind of people. He loves all people. His heart is impartial. Secondly, God's heart is patient. Oh, man, this is really important. God's heart is patient, and I'll explain to you why. And then thirdly, God's heart is concerned about man's spiritual destiny. That's what's important to him. Other things are not that important. He's concerned about the spiritual destiny of men. That's his heart. So let's look at each one of these. First of all, God's heart is impartial. Look at verses 1 through 4 in Jonah chapter 4. Uh, now, this surprised you when you start out in verse 1. But greatly displeased, Jonah became angry. What was he displeased about? That all this whole city got saved. All these people got saved. 
Uh, notice that uh, notice verses 9 and 10. He says, who knows of chapter 3? Who knows God may turn and relent and withdraw his burning anger so that we will not perish. When God saw their deeds, they, they had turned from their wicked way, then God relented concerning the calamity which he declared upon them to bring upon them. And he did not do it. God changed from judgment to forgiveness. He did not bring the judgment upon them. And what happened? Jonah got angry. Somebody has said Jonah's the only citywide evangelist to be successful and got mad about it. But listen to what Jonah said. But it was greatly displeased Jonah and became angry. And he prayed. This is his prayer. He prayed to the Lord. Please, Lord, was this not what I said when I was still in my own country? I knew you were going to do this. Therefore, in order to forestall, the, uh, I fled to Tarshish. Think about that. You're familiar. God told him, now, I want you to take this message uh, to them. And, and Jonah didn't want to do it. And so he ran away to Tarshish, acting like God was not in Tarshish. You know, I talk about my Jonah experience. When, when I was in high school, my last year, I had my plans. I, I had planned for a very long time to try to get into the U.S. Military Academy at West Point and have a military career. And uh, my senior year at our church, we had a youth evangelistic meeting, and I was asked to preach during that meeting, and I was very hesitant about doing that. But uh, the Lord used it, and, and people began to come to me saying, I think God called you to preach. I said, no, not me. Uh, and and so for about a two-year period, I, I joined the Coast Guard with my brother. And for about a two-year period, I ran away from the Lord. I, I thought, if I can just get out of Dallas and all this preaching nonsense, th then this will go away. And I tell people, I forgot that God was in California just like he was in <laughs> Dallas. So that's what uh, uh, Jonah experienced here. And he said, Lord, I knew this was going to happen when I fled to Tarshish, verse 2, for I knew that you are a gracious God. I know you are gracious and compassionate and slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness and one who relents concerning calamity. Therefore, he's so mad. Therefore now, O Lord, take my life. Please take my life. For death is better to me than life. And listen to what the Lord said. The Lord said, do you have good reason to be angry? Jonah doesn't even answer him. So Jonah got angry. Why? Why did Jonah get angry? Well, there, there are three reasons those in the outline that I want to give you. The first one, we don't think about this, but the first one is because he was afraid he would be regarded as a false prophet. You say, why would they regard him as a false prophet? Well, turn over to Deuteronomy Deuteronomy 18 is on your outline. Deuteronomy 18. And verses 21 and 22. How would you know, in the Old Testament, how would you know whether a person was a prophet of God or not? 
they were a false prophet. Well, look at what verses 21, 22 says. He says, so you may say in your heart, how would we know the word the Lord had spo not spoken? How, would, how do we know when somebody is a false prophet and this is not the word that the Lord has spoken? Well, he tells us in verse 22, when a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, is a thing that does not come about and uh, come true, then the thing which is spoken is not, uh, the Lord has not spoken. In other words, if a true prophet of God, whatever he spoke, would come true 100%. If it wasn't, then he's not a true prophet. Now, what would be the modern day application? If somebody says they are a preacher of God, if what they're saying does not been, has not been validated by the Bible, they're not showing you in the Bible where the Bible is it, they are not a true prophet of God. If they're saying things that are contrary to what the Bible said, they're false prophets. They're false preachers. False teachers. Uh, now, his message was one of judgment. And he was afraid God was going to change his mind and, and, and uh, he'd be regarded as a false prophet. See, he's just thinking about himself. He's not thinking about these people who are lost. See, w one thing Jonah forgot was this. Jonah forgot that divine judgment may be averted by a genuine repentance. Or to put it another way, some things that God pronounces are conditional. If you do this, I will do this. If you don't do this, I will not do this. They're conditional, and we forget that. So Jonah, was, he was just afraid, boy, he wouldn't be regarded as a true prophet of God, uh, and he... He forgot that divine judgment is averted by genuine repentance. So that's the first reason he was angry. Second reason was because he was afraid what the Jewish brethren would think. The Jewish brethren, they didn't like these people. And uh, the Jewish brethren forgot God's original purpose Remember in uh, Genesis 12? The Jews forgot the original purpose of the nation. God says very clear in G the Abrahamic covenant in Genesis 12 that he's going to raise them up and, and people will bless them, but he's going to raise them up to carry the message of, of salvation to the Gentile world. The Jews forgot that. And so he was afraid of what his Jewish brothers said. See, notice it just is selfish. He just focused on himself. I don't want them to think I'm a false prophet. I don't want them to think I'm uh, uh, going against them. So he was angry because of that. Because he knew what God could do. But let me give you the third. The third one's the main reason he got angry. He didn't like these people. He didn't like them. The Assyrian people, the nation of Assyria, they were a wicked people. He didn't like them. They were idolatrous. They were cruel. They were wicked. They were bloodthirsty. And they wanted to put, they, they wanted to have a conquest of one nation after another. They went against God's people. Second Kings 18 is an example of one of the things and when, in, this, in this story, when they went after God's people, Israel, 
185,000 people died. He didn't like these people. And before we get too critical, think about this. If you were living during the time of Adolf Hitler and all the stuff he did, would you be praying for his salvation? No. Or what about uh, 9-11, Saddam Hussein? He didn't like these people. But God is impartial. God does not just say, I love certain kind of people. I love all people. I want all people to be saved. Uh, and, and so that was the major reason. And Jonah rebukes God. I can't imagine this. When, in verse 2, when he begins to pray, Jonah rebukes God in his prayer. Somebody has said he prayed for his best prayer in the worst place. That's when he was in the great fish, you know. He, and... And now he's praying his worst prayer as, as the city turns to God. So Jonah was angry. He said, Lord, I knew. How did he know? Well, Psalm 86, 15. I knew you were a gracious God. I knew you were a compassionate God. I knew you were a patient and loving God. I knew this is what was going to happen. That's why I ran away. You see, sometimes we are selective in our compassion and love. But God is not like that. God has compassion and love and mercy for all types of people. And so his heart is impartial. Many times our, our hearts are very selfish. And we're only focused on self like Jonah. But God's heart is for people and the salvation of people. All right, let me give you a second one. Oh, God's heart is there. God's heart is not only impartial, and boy, I'm glad of this. God's heart is patient. He's patient. Boy, am I glad he's patient. I, I'm telling you, if God was not patient, even as a believer, if God was not patient toward me, I would have been in real trouble a long time ago. God is patient. Uh, now, look at verses 5 to 8. Right after it says, Jonah became angry, didn't... You have, Lord said, don't you have good reason to be angry? He doesn't even answer. It says in verse, beginning in verse 5, Then Jonah went out from the city, and he sat east of it. There he made a shelter for himself, and sat under the, the shade until... He could see what happened in the city. So he's up above the city. And he's noticing what's happened. So the Lord, he made this shelter. So the Lord appointed a plant. Lord gives uh, some very important object lesson here. So the Lord appointed a plant. And it grew over Jonah to be a shade over his head to deliver him from his discomfort. And listen to this. And Jonah was extremely happy about the plant. He was unhappy about all those people getting saved. But he's happy about the plant. And God appointed a worm. So he appointed the plant, and he appointed a worm. God's teaching him a lesson. When, when dawn came the next day, and it attacked the plant, and the plant withered. It withered. And the sun came up, 
and God appointed a scorching east wind. So he appointed his plant, and then he appointed a worm to destroy the plant, and then he appointed a scorching east wind when the sun beat down on Jonah's head so that he became faint and begged with all of his soul to die, saying, Death is better for me than life. Death is better for me than life. God's notice he waited to see what would happen in the city. And God showed his patience and forgiveness, we know in verse 2. So he gives an object lesson. God provided a vine. And notice the vine made Jonah very happy. And the people of Nineveh got saved, and that made him very angry. So God appointed a vine. He appointed a worm and a scorching east wind. Now, why did God do this? God is giving an object lesson to Jonah what it's like to be lost. To be, uh, God is giving an object to, to show what it's like to be in eternal hell, helpless, hopeless, miserable. Now, it's a long way from the real way, but he's trying to give him an object lesson. Now, I want to ask you this question. Why is God so patient with men? I mean, do you ever think, Lord, I just wish you'd come back and make all this right. Why is God so patient with men? Well, the Bible, we don't have to guess about it. The Bible tells us. Look at Second Peter. Everybody turn their Bibles to Second Peter. Second Peter chapter three. Now Peter uses the illustration of the worldwide flood here to teach uh, an important point on patience. Beginning in verse 3, listen to what Peter says. Know this, first of all, that in the last days, and we're living in the last days, I have had people ask me a lot, are we living in, getting close to the last day or... We've been living in the last days ever since the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus. We're in the church age. That's the last age. Now, if you ask me, is this the last of the last age? I, I don't know. Uh, but uh, he says, know this first of all, that in the last days, mockers will, with their mocking, falling after their own lust and saying, where is the promise of his coming? You Christians, you talk about his coming all the time. He hadn't come. It's been 2,000 years, he hadn't come. Where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. For when they maintain, listen to this, for when they maintain, it escapes their notice that by the word of God, the heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of water and by water, though they, though which the world at that time was destroyed, being flooded with the water, worldwide flood, worldwide flood. But by his word, the present heavens and earth are being reserved for fire, keep kept for the day of judgment and destruction but you do not let this one fact escape your notice beloved that one day is like a thousand years to the lord where is the promise of his coming these mockers saying 
Where is the promise of his coming? And they try, they, it's been 2,000 years. And he hasn't come back. He's not going to come back. And Peter says, you, you, you overlook. You overlook the, the, the thing of that one day, it's only been two days to God. In other words, God is not confined about time. And, and Peter's trying to say they were doing the same thing when Noah was telling them there's a flood coming. Do you remember how long Noah had to warn them about the flood coming? 120 years. 120 years. And he said they were saying the same thing, but the flood came. But look at verse 9. The Lord is not slow about his promise. It's not because the Lord is slow about his promise. As some count slowness. But is patient toward you not wishing that any of you to perish and all come to repentance. In other words, why is God so patient with men? Because he wants them to be saved. He just keeps being patient and patient and patient. He wants them to be saved. But I must say this also. My friend, even God's patience has a limit. And one day, one day, God's patience is going to come to an end. He's going to come back and make everything right. Those who refuse to bow to him now are going to bow later. Every tongue is going to confess. Every tongue is going to bow. Every knee is going to bow. God's patience does have an end. But God keeps being patient. He, and, he, and we are to appreciate this as believers. God is patient with us. We keep fouling up. He forgives us. He's patient. Helps us to keep going. God is patient because he loves us and he wants to care for us. So, you want to be effective in evangelism? Have an impartial heart like God. Have a, a patient heart like God. And then the third way God's heart is concerned about man's spiritual destiny. God's focus is on man's spiritual destiny. Now, look at verses 9 through 11. The scorching east wind came, verse 8. Jonah says, death is better than me than life. Now listen to this, verse 9. Then God said to Jonah, Do you have good reason to be angry about the plants? And he said, I have good reason to be angry. Now listen. God said, verse 10, Then the Lord said, You have compassion on the plant for which you did not work, you did not grow, and it came up overnight and perished overnight. You're very concerned about this plant. You had nothing to do with it. Then verse 11, should you, you, you're, you have compassion on the plant. If you have compassion on the plant, verse 11, should I not have compassion on Nineveh? Would it be all right, Jonah, for me to have compassion 
for which a city, great city in which 120,000 people do not know their left from their right. And it says also, as well as many animals. I heard a preacher, a great preacher from Chicago, preach on this one time. And he talked about, we had a lot of animals in Chicago too. Uh, but notice the contrast. Jonah is concerned about plants. God is concerned about people. And, and that's our problem many times. Many times we are more concerned about certain things in our life than we are for people who are lost. We're concerned about our careers. We're concerned about our comfort and our personal pleasure. We're concerned about our interests and our goals and our financial success. And there's nothing wrong with these things, but they should not be more important. Jonah was concerned about a plant. Plant made him happy. People getting saved made him angry, especially these people. He was concerned about plans. God is always concerned about people. God's number one, listen to this, God's number one concern is the spiritual condition of people. We need to have the heart of God for the lost. We need to have the heart of God for the world. And when we do that, we'll be like Gus. One person after another, we will see come to Christ. And we'll have the same attitude that Gus has, as long as it takes. As long as it takes. My friend, God loves people. God doesn't care about things. God loves people. He cares about people and their eternal destiny. And so should we. This is the heart that we must have in our church if we're going to be effective in evangelism. This is the heart we must have if we're going to be effective personally in our evangelism. We need to be a church that has the heart of God. And we will see people coming to Christ one after one after one. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this very important lesson. Help us to have the kind of heart you have for people who are lost, for people who need salvation. Give us opportunities over and over again to talk to people about Jesus and help us to rely upon the Holy Spirit of God every time we have an opportunity. Help us to be a church that has the heart of God for people and use us in this community and around the world, wherever you take us, to talk to people about Jesus. Lord, may they say about the churches here in Atwater and Merced, the same thing they said about the disciples in the church in Jerusalem, that they filled Jerusalem with his teaching. 
And so, Lord, help us to be that kind of church. And so I commit this message to you and to your people. And I pray that you will use it in each one of our lives. Help us to have the heart of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Stand. We're going to go ahead and sing our last song, There is a Fountain.
sin. Good singing today, everybody. You are dismissed.